So basically, we're warming up for the CSEC exam. We have some sample multiple choice that we're going to be going through along with some short essay type questions. And so here it goes. So it says, number one, which of the following statements Sorry, sir. is true about particles in a gas? All right, so question one says, which of the following statements is true about particles in a gas? And, you know, when you think about gas, you know, it's a state of matter. We have the three states, solid, liquid, and gas. So we want to talk about the particles. They get larger when they're heated. Do they, they can move in any direction. They can, they are closely packed together. They have strong forces be, between them. And now as a student here, so you can do elimination with your multiple choice. So definitely C and D would be out because we know particles in a solid are the ones that are closely packed. And because of their closeness or one of the reasons why they're closely packed is because of the strong forces of attraction. That is not the case in gases. So that is out. Now, they actually can move in any direction. So if you can recall, one of the properties is that the particles are capable of doing what we call random motion, random movement. So B would have been the most appropriate response. Question two says, which of the following phrases illustrates diffusion? And automatically, we want to run back through, you know, particles moving from a high concentration to a low concentration until it is evenly distributed. So there's an A perfume scent throughout the air in a room. And that sounds like our answer. But just to just to run through the random motion of pollen dust in water. And we know that is not what we're talking about. That's actually Brownian motion. The swelling of red beans soaked in water. And that is due to osmosis, the loss of heat from a hot body to a cold body. And we know that deals with the conduction or convection current. And so A would have been the appropriate response. All right, um, question three says, a gaseous substance is slowly cooled. And so what you're looking at, you're looking right here at a cooling curve, curve for a substance. And the temperature recorded every second results are shown on a graph. And when we look at it, we're seeing the, the results. Now, one of the things that we want to remember, these slant lines basically will represent the states of matter. And if it's a cooling curve, then A would have been when the substance is at a gas, C would have been when the substance is at a liquid, and, well, it's not labeled, this area would have been meant when the substance is basically at a solid. B is when you have both liquid and gas, and right here, right, you will have what we call the boiling point, and then C, sorry, D, you basically have solid and liquid. And this would have been our melting point and also our, in this case, our freezing point. So let's take a look at what they ask. At which point is the substance a solid? And now, again, sometimes you need to remember that it's the most appropriate response. So persons may be looking and saying, but they did not label this part here. But the substance will be a solid right here as well. D, you have solid and you have liquid being present. Question could be faulty in the sense that um, it didn't say solid only. 
but you know persons will more be looking for this area to represent the solid but still d would have been the most appropriate response because at c it is entirely liquid at b it is liquid and gas and then at a it's a gas question four it says which of the following statements illustrate osmosis and osmosis basically deals with the movement of particles similar and a lot of times even though it's a cross between our little biology and our chemistry um, students sometimes think that osmosis and diffusions are it is actually separate and apart osmosis is a form of diffusion and it really just speaks specifically to water molecules and these water molecules will be moving from high concentration where you have a lot of the water molecules and where we have a lot of it um, is where we normally call the dilute you know and of course where you have fewer water molecules we basically call it concentrated and so sometimes when we talk about high concentration to low concentration, students tend to get a little bit, um, you know, mixed up in terms of that. But just know it's going to move from where you have a lot of water molecules to where you have small amount of water molecules. In other words, it moves from a dilute to a concentrated. And so if you can figure that out, also it will happen across a membrane a differentially partially um differentially membrane and so we look at it we know that um the pollen dust is out we spoke about diffusion being that for the perfume molecules going through the air and so we want to hear about the water molecules so c is the most res um appropriate response the movement of water molecules across a cellophane membrane into a concentrated glucose solution and so as i said before the water molecules are always moving from where they're in a dilute to a concentrated definitely d would have been out that is basically speaking again to diffusion which of the following substance is a suspension and we have milk, we have gasoline, we have chalk in water, we have sugar in water. And we say we're going with the sugar in water. The particles will basically settle out and you'll see them at the bottom. Um, a separating funnel can be used to separate a mixture of and we know that separating funnel is basically used to separate two liquids that we consider to be immiscible meaning these two liquids should not mix and liquids when you have a when you go back to a solution or any other form of mixture you usually have either a solid and a, a liquid at times, but if you have two liquids and they're not mixing, we call that immiscible. We know like will dissolve like. And so polar is able to, you know, mix with polar, while non-polar or organic will basically mix with organic. And so if what you need to do is to be able to identify what is a polar and what is a non-polar um, liquid in this case? Now, water, as we know, is polar. Ethanol is also polar, slight, um, po polar because of when you when you go into organic chemistry, ethanol is one of your basically your organic um, compounds. It is it has a functional group, the hydroxyl group. Um, that basically is the OH, and that's also a basically partially, you know, polar, and so water will dissolve in ethanol. Now, 
we cannot use this once the two liquids can mix and so we said that would be out now water and kerosene kerosene is more of an organic compound right and water is more of a polar compound and so that would have been the the concept right there where we would have been able to separate and they would have properties that allow them to be separated in terms of their density um in terms of again the polarity if they're polar or non-polar water and solid sodium chloride definitely not we know that that's basically going to dissolve you cannot use that means of a filter funnel to do i'm sorry a separating funnel to do that kerosene and solid sodium chloride no and so as we said d would have been the most um, appropriate response so we're moving moving along which of the following can be obtained by the process of sedimentation and we know that sedimentation we said when we leave it to stand and a popular example would have been soil and water or sand and water after after a period of time you know it would basically separate or sediment um you, you see those distinct layers um a lot of times as students a, a bio experiment as well we, we may not see it so much in chemistry when you look at the soil and you basically add water to it and you shake it and then you allow it to stand and you can use that to check certain um, properties of the soil in terms of the type of soil and all of that so d would have been the most um, appropriate res response all right so it speaks about and if you notice most of these questions we are looking at separation techniques so which of the following techniques may be used to separate a mixture of pigments into individual components once you go pigments we should start to think about paper chromatography right remember um, we said fractional distillation that's what we use to deal with crude oil um, substances that may have close or similar well close um in terms of interval of their boiling point we use fractional distillation solvent extraction we we basically have centrifugation we we spoke about you know how we go about testing our blood and to see the red blood cell count and to figure out if the concept of us if we are anemic or not um nine speaks about the process um you may have questions you know cxc may bring multiple choice they can bring um question regarding the whole process of sugarcane so the ph of fresh sugarcane juice which is usually in the range of 5.0 to 5.5 and we know anything that is below seven it is considered to be acidic and so we want to change that acidity to to basically 7.5 or to eight and this will basically aid in the process you can you can review the process of how we basically obtain the sugar from sugar cane but what we use we if we want to increase the ph of something making it more alkaline um majority right away we said we can we can do elimination so a would be out even if you don't know what that is it says acid and the contents is already acidic you put in an acid there you know that is only going to let it remain so we're really looking at something that will basically allow it to 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 increase that ph so we want a base right and so when we look at limestone we know that that is a base calcium carbonate and we look at slake lime that's also a base calcium um, hydroxide um, sodium chloride is actually if, if you if you if you think about sodium chloride it's more of a neutral compound when you place that in a solution 
you get more of a pH of 7. So it's really between limestone and slake lime. Now limestone is what? It's not used in this sort of industry. We basically use that um, in Jamaica. We have carib cement. And so, you know, one major component of that is the calcium carbonate. So in sugarcane, what we use to increase is the calcium hydroxide slake line. Cool? All right. So 10 says a substance X with a boiling point of 58 degrees Celsius is miscible. And the opposite of immiscible is miscible. So these substances X and Y are basically capable of mixing with each other. And so right away, we cannot use the separating funnel to, to basically um, use as a means of separating these two liquids. Because while you open the, the, the valve, everything would be mixing. And so you're not going to have that separation. Remember, we said that we bank on the fact that the density of one is usually lower than the other. And that causes, you know, one to be at the top, one to be at the bottom. You said of boiling point, um, Y is of a boiling point of 94 degrees. A mixture, um, they, this should be off. These two liquids can best be separated in into its components by, and you know, we want to, we said sublimation. Um, sublimation deals with getting the substance from a, uh, a, uh, uh, basically a solid to a liquid to a gas directly to a gas and so we wouldn't really think about this this is not the case usually when you're doing sublimation you would have had two two solids and one of them basically will undergo sublimation um remember our compounds like or dry ice um, the same thing we call um, carbon dioxide, um, the air fresheners, or naphthalene. Um, in Jamaica, you know, we refer to that as being camphor ball. So that those items, if you have two um, ammonium chloride, another substance, that will basically go through sublimation. So if you have a mixture of naphthalene and ammonium chloride, Sublimation cannot be the method because both of them will basically, you know, get turned into a gas. And so you have to, when you're thinking about separating technique, you think about the property of one of the, the, the components that the other one doesn't have or, you know, what you can play around with to basically separate the, the substances. So we use fractional distillation use fractional distillation right um simple distillation we normally use that to to acquire um pure water from 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 sea water right and so fractional distillation would have been the appropriate response we, we kind of step it up now we're talking a little bit once we see protons we know we're now on the topic of atomic structure it says two particles have the following composition. So I, um, 10 protons, 12 neutrons, 10 electrons. Um, two, 10 protons, 11 neutrons, and 10 electrons. They are therefore both. Um, when you, you want to examine because when you when you look at this you know we're looking at the subatomic particles and we know that once you have the same number once you're seeing the same protons we're we're basically talking about the same element because the proton would have been your the identity it's like you doing cxc you have a candidate number it doesn't change. So once you see 10 proton, it's speaking to a specific element, right? So we know both of them are from the same element. 
what is and if you're dealing with atoms then they basically are neutral so they have the same number of protons same number of electrons so you notice both of them do have 10 electrons 10 protons what is the difference is the neutrons we should remember that the neutrons we find them located in in the nucleus of the atom that's where we also find the protons and you know both of them we normally refer to them you know coming together to give you the mass number or the nuclear number and we can see that because both of them we find them in the nucleus so they are both isotopes isotopes are basically you know atoms of the same element that have different numbers of neutrons right so continuing so we just spoke about isotopes and here they are again an isotope of lead can be represented by the following symbol we have 207 we we have 82 and we have pb and as a student you need to be familiar with the the notation right so the top number um in some books you 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 basically see they refer to it as a and that represents the mass number and that number tells you the number of protons and neutrons and then of course that 82 represents the atomic number which is the number of protons we also see the pb right and you know if you're wondering basically some of the the elements they get the name from that um the greek um letters so the that name of the element um it wouldn't be using the l right so we use the pb from this symbol it can be deduced that one atom of the isotope has does it have 82 neutrons no because we know that the neutrons are basically adding to give you that mass number and the 82 really represents the proton and so b right away 82 represents the proton the 125 could never be the proton protons are actually right there as the atomic number and the 207 is the mass number so would have been 82 protons still on isotopes radioactive isotopes are normally used in the what now we know isotopes are very helpful we recognize that because of the unstable nucleus um you know that neutron and that proton we make use of them we do use them for the determination of the age of fossil fuel sometimes you're watching this disco the discovery channel and they can tell you how long you know this organism was on the earth or how long if they find remains how long it was there yeah um so we basically have the isotope for that um carbon 14 we have um isotopes that help us with the treatment of cancer yes that helps to destroy the the cancerous cells in our body right um we do not we do not really we don't have any isotopes to treat influenza right so c is out we do have isotopes that we use to basically power certain submar submarines to get um, electricity or to get um you know current and all of that so that it can basically carry out its function 14 it says which of these elements have seven electrons in its outer shell we know that you know if you if you go back to this start of your program your teacher would have said that once you're doing atomic structure you want to be able to know the atomic number of the first 20 elements so cxc that's a requirement 
because any question based on atomic structure mark you you have other elements that you would be required to know like for example zinc copper even lead that we look at a while ago falls outside of the 20 but these when once they're being really asked an atomic question they're going to be going to the first 20 right so is it hydrogen is it oxygen and you're supposed to know the groups and so chlorine is from group seven also the halides right the halogens they are in that group so they have seven electrons on their outer shell if you know the atomic number you could have basically work it out um if i put it beside right here remember it is actually 17 for the atomic number so it's two eight and seven and right there we know the final number gives you the group that the element is in and it also speaks to the amount of valence electrons that there are um so you can do that and that's why they say you're supposed to know the first 20 elements along with that just to include right here it also can tell you the group sorry the period which means you know the amount of occupied shell with electrons so this element is actually in period three still on isotopes isotopes of an element contain do they contain the same number of protons when we looked at the question earlier yes the one with the 10 protons and the 10 um, electrons um, sometimes you can do that for questions as well based on what you do on a paper maybe you can get a little you know if you if you had looked at a question before you can basically use that as a guide so it wouldn't make sense you would actually look at that and choose that to be an isotope or know that it's an isotope and come here and say that they wouldn't have the same number of protons they do so one we know definitely is correct the same number of neutrons no because we know it is the fact that these isotopes they will have different mass numbers and let me let me speak again to isotopes because we're using this it's our warm-up to cxc we know that isotopes they basically have similar chemical properties because they have the same number of electrons on their outer shell and so they when they involve in chemical reactions they're going to be reacting the same way but when you look at the physical properties it's going to be slightly different because of the slightly difference in their mass number which is due to the difference in the neutrons so this one that they have that says the same number of neutrons no that is out different number of electrons no that is out as well remember we saw where both those isotopes that we looked at they would have had the same number of electrons a matter of fact as we said if it is that you're talking about an atom atoms the isotopes are atoms of the same element and if i am an atom even what is going back to the fact that they would have similar chemical properties because they will have similar electronic configuration so the same number of protons as electrons which is also true because both of them are going to be atoms so one and four and so that will be b we're jumping right back at it here we have which of the following statements illustrate brownian motion and right away a we spoke about this the random motion of pollen dust in water right it must have meant um, mr robert brown if i'm not mistaken you know you observe pollen dust you know maybe that was a thing back then 
your thing now is maybe TikTok and, and Instagram. They used to just sit and say, all right, let me go watch some pollen dust in water and see what is happening. So he noticed that without the wind, the dust still moved. And he was saying that it must have been the fact that the water molecules are basically, you know, moving. The water molecules were actually hitting on the pollen, the pollen dust that was there and it was causing it to change its location. So that's where that came out, all right? Item 17 and 18 refer to the relative charges and approximate masses of four particles listed below, right? And so we see where we have the charge and we have the approximate mass. It says, in answering 17 and 18, each item may be used more than once, once, or not at all. Which of the above properties refers to a neutron? And again, we know that a neutron, we find that in the, in the, in the, the nucleus, we know that the neutron doesn't have a charge, right? And it also contributes to the mass. So it would have been B. We know about proton. Protons are positive, and that is what gives the nucleus that positiveness. And so we look for the one with the positive charge, right? We're seeing that at A is the only one there with a positive charge and the mass of one, right? And so we know that A is for that. Which of the following are radioactive um, isotopes not used? Um, so we use it in radiotherapy, we use it in carbon dating, we use it in energy generation, but in terms of metal extraction, like aluminum and iron, we don't use radioactive isotopes in that area. Which are the following separation technique is not used during the extraction of um, sucrose from the sugar cane. Again, you want to run through, visit the process of how we get the sugar. Filtration is one of them. You know, you want to separate the, um, the soluble particles from the liquid particles. We speak about the concept of precipitation. So that is actually at the end part. So that's how you get the, the sugar that you may use, you know, in, 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 in your respective meals or to make your drink or whatever tea centrifugation all right is also another process using it to separate the liquid from the solid right but paper um chromatography no we don't use that technique right which of the following substances form dense white fumes with ammonia gas and again, most teachers would have gone through the diffusion in, 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 in gases and they would have used that um, glass rod, right? That glass tube with ammonia and a particular compound to get the, the, the white ring, right? And that white ring in that glass tube would have been from the concept of ammonia reacting with another gas and that gas would have been hydrogen chloride or if you look at it in terms of an acid hydrochloric acid um these are solubility curves right so we know the mass is against temperature Remember that once you hear one variable against another, we know that the first one goes on the y-axis, the second one goes on the x-axis. So we're looking at various different um, substances, right? And we're looking at their solubility. Cool? So we examine, it says that approximately what temperature is the solubility of hydrated copper to sulfate and sodium chloride the same so usually is where they intercept so we say hydrated copper two so right here let me see if i can get something to place there 
right at this point, right? And so, again, for these things, we have to basically look at the approximate because it, it doesn't have any lines, right? You might, some persons may say and say, you know, it looks like it is 60, right? And so when you when you venture down, we 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 notice we're not seeing any sixty in terms of our response. So again, as I said before, the most appropriate response, right? And again, if you draw the line, and even that doesn't look too straight, but we know it's not. 45 it's not 35 it's not 25 it's closer to 55 which is right there the mass number of an element is the number of and we spoke about this earlier as well we know that the neutrons in addition to the protons right so c neutrons and protons in an atom of the element we didn't even have to look at D, right? When X and Y are stirred together in a beaker, the mixture filtered, X and Y are both present in the filtrate. Which of the following could describe the mixture formed by X and Y? Now we know solutions basically dissolve the one that will basically not be able when you have solid particles and as i said before you think about soil and water as a major example of suspension we know that that one basically will not have the concept of it being able to be small enough to go through the filter paper so we can also talk about the elimination technique because we know solutions are definitely out because the solvent would have been dissolving that once you pass that through the filter paper it actually what comes out in the as the filtrate so once you see one anyone that has one you can already eliminate that one so we know a and c would be out right three but sorry we know that it would contain one my bad so because we know that it says it will come out through we know it will contain one right because we know solutions colloids also so like milk is a colloid so one and two would have been the appropriate so anyone with three would have been out Which of the following mixtures are arranged in order of increasing particles, particle size? And we know we're talking about from a small to large. So solution, colloid, suspension, and right away, A, we get our answer. That is the order. So solution has the smallest particles followed by colloids, and suspension has the largest particles. Sulfur and oxygen are in the same group of the periodic table because we know that what place elements in the same group is the fact that they have the same number of valence electrons. And so they can react with each other? No, that's not a reason why they're in the same group. That means everybody can be in the same group um, except the, the, the noble gases. Right, the atomic number of sulfur is 16, and the relative atomic mass of oxygen is 16. Is that true? So, is it because the atomic number both, both those concepts are true? Yes, true in the sense of what it is saying but that's not the reason why they're in the same group they have the same number of electrons in their outer shell that's the reason right there so c would have been your most appropriate response 
When we look at 27, it says the arrangement of electrons in atoms X and Y are 2, 8, 5. And we spoke about this electronic configuration. We said that this is in period 3 and it's also in group 5. That is in period 3 and it is in group 6. Now we don't have to be concerning ourselves with if it would be good. It's a plus. Because, again, you should have known the first 20 elements. But let's take, for example, you don't remember. What you can do is to say this. You see, outside of boron, elements that have one, two, or three electrons on their outer shell would have been metals. So once they have one, two, or three on their valence shell, they are metals. Right? And... Those who have four, five, six, and seven are non-metals. So here we have the two elements. One has five, one has six. And so right away, those two would have been non-metals. And who, which um, combination that would have been B. So non X is a non-metal, Y is a non-metal. So... The notation we spoke about it already and right away i mean the the, the questions the the answers are supposed to start to flow and this is what i am saying sometimes the questions you know cxc tend to repeat multiple choice questions as well i don't advise persons you know some some of my students you know they will want to sit and study the multiple choice so they say oh the answer for that is a god forbid cxc changes around how they, 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 they put the responses. So for this time, they put it at A and they move it down to D. Then it causes problem. What you need to know is the, the knowledge behind it. Why? So the notation, we should know the, 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 as we said, the top number, mass number, one below, the atomic number, and then the element symbol is right there. So the 17 represents the atomic number, which is the number of protons. Particles of a solid cannot move about freely because the particles have high density. Is that the reason why they can't move freely? The forces of attractions are very strong, and we spoke about that earlier as well. That's one of the reasons, you know, that leads to the particles not being able to move around freely. A matter of fact, when you talk about the particles in a solid, um, in books, in literature, you'll see they mention that they vibrate in a fixed position, right? So they are very strong, strong forces of attraction between the particles. Which of the following processes does not provide evidence? support of the particulate, particulate nature of matter. They said that there are four things that deals with this. We said matter is made up of particles. Secondly, these particles are in constant motion and of course temperature affects how, you know, the motion of these particles. The other, the other thing about it, we said that particles have spaces between them. And then finally, we say that there is some form of attraction between the particles. Now, which one of these evidence? Filtration is the one out. So osmosis, diffusion, and Brownian motion. Remember, we said osmosis. If, if the water molecules right move from an area of high concentration to a low concentration right the 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 diffusion the fact that you know again even gases is is the fact that matter has space between it or else you know the the gases wouldn't be able to move the the air is not stationary again brownian motion with the pollen grain the pollen grain was able to change its location because the water molecules, even when you look at it with the naked eye, 
it seems as if that it's stationary but the water molecules are actually moving so if you have a glass of water on a table the water molecules are actually moving it's not stationary Let me see. Mr. Yes, miss. What is the answer for number 23? All right. So when we when we look at this area, there's a little miss up with this part of the question and the numbering as well. So liquids differ from solids in that, and A, it says the particles in a liquid are more strongly attracted to each other. And that can't be true because we know the particles in a solid are the ones that are more attracted. We jump down right here to the rest of the, the option. The particles in a liquid cannot move as free, freely as the particles in a solid. That's not the case because liquids, we know that liquids flow, right? That's why we can pour out some water. The particles in a liquid are arranged in a definite way. That's not true because we know, you know, the particles in a liquid tend to take the shape of their container. And then it is D. It says the particles in a liquid possess more energy than the particles in a solid, which is definitely true. Going back to 38, even though we have 32 to do, we, we, I said there's a little issue with the numbering. The liquid that is immiscible with water is immiscible with water, meaning again, we're seeing this term, it will not mix with water. And again, we said that when we get questions that speaks to the separating funnel and the immiscible and miscible, we look at the fact that we're dealing with a organic compound and since we're dealing with water which is a polar the one that would be miscible is one that has a is an organic now some of the organic compounds we have two organic compounds right there the ethanol but the ethanol has that oh right and when you do organic chemistry, it's the functional group. And so the OH allows the, the compound to kind of have some level of um, polarity. It, 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 is, it is basically the O and the H. Again, the oxygen, you know, tend to, you know, pull the electrons closer, so it becomes more negative. The hydrogen tends to, you know, lose the electrons, so it becomes more positive and so you have that little difference in charge and that's what helps um the 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 or allows when you have that difference in a charge allow it to be polar and so ethanol being a slightly polar molecule will dissolve in water milk is the same vinegar also another um organic compound it's an acid you note it with the COOH um, functional group and that itself again you're seeing the concept of it having some level of polarity and so those two are able to mix so the organic compound right there is the the gasoline right and even with your cars you know that's one of the reasons why you know if you if you ever hear um the the, the males or Drivers talk about that head gasket and water getting into the engine. That's not supposed to happen because when you have water now mixing with the gas, that is what creates the problem. And a matter of fact, they're not going to mix. Cool. A liquid will boil. Right? And we said that there's a difference between boiling and evaporation. We said that in terms of evaporation, it can happen at any any temperature right any temperature will cause that boiling has to happen at a specific temperature and that's why we have boiling points right so we have boiling points of liquids and so it is coming from that we also said that boiling it occurs at all aspect of the liquid 
while evaporation occurs at the surface, right? But if something, you know, when it comes to boil, it is the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure. That's when something starts to basically boil. And if you look at the boiling point, one of the things that we use when we're doing those lab is the capillary tube and we use that to see the bubbles and once the bubbles cease, that's the time we record temperature from the thermometer and all of that and that helps us determine the boiling point. Which of the following is not a method of separation and definitely melting, that's a change of state, right? The modern periodic table it arranges the elements in order of, and we know that elements are placed in the order of increasing atomic number. So as you, and you know, as we said, first 20 guys, once you know the first 20, um, any atomic structure question you should be able to, to answer, right? And then finally, we, we, well, not finally, because we have some other Questions that we, we mix the numbers for. So elements in the same group are similar. Similar because again the similarity comes in because they have the same number of electrons in their outer shell. So they have similar chemical properties. Particles are closest um, in definitely here solids you should know that when a liquid changes directly to a gas the process is called and we did mention this already sublimation right sorry my bad it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a tricky question it, it, it even caught me a while ago it says a liquid oftentimes we are used to questions me i'm saying from a solid to a gas. So it is still speaking about a liquid to a gas, which is evaporation. All right, guys. The opposite of evaporation is, and we know that is condensing. Fractional distillation separates liquids which have different boiling points. And as we said, these, these liquids are usually miscible. And so we bank on the fact of using fractional distillation. And the, 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 the boiling point should be one that is not too close. They're not supposed to be too close. Like the example or the question that they gave us earlier that spoke to one having a 95 and I think about 50 something degrees Celsius, right? And that would bring us to the end of our, that aspect of the, 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 the warm up. So just running through some multiple choice. These were taken mainly from, as you notice, separation technique. You have a little atomic structure here and there. Um, so basic, you have isotopes coming out. So we basically would have, you know, just touched the, the first part. Just a little tops of the, the 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 first topics in chemistry. If you if you really had challenges going through that, then you know you have some work to be done. All right. Worksheet.